lamentamente hablamos en, en inglés. Everybody understands, yeah? Yeah. If you don't understand anything, just stop me, really. There is a small group, it's a small room, it's raining outside, very intimate. I already have three glasses of wine, so it's going to be casual, yeah? But the topic, unfortunately, is kind of complex and, and heavy. So I'm going to try to make it uh, really uh, simple and not heavy at all. So let's see if I, if I manage. Okay, making a mesh, let's go. One design and the whole lighting industry is in a moment of change right now. Um, we're in a very interesting threshold period in history. I think it's a, a good, incredibly lucky moment to be involved in lighting industry um, as a designer, as a manufacturer, as a student, as anything else, or as an architect, or interior designer, or developer, simply because we are going through this uh, change. So. We all know about the hardware. Hardware has always been there, this kind of stuff. Um, often quite not very interesting in, in architectural world. Uh, that's now starting to merge with software, but software in a kind of an interesting way, because end of the day, the, uh, the advent of LED meant that suddenly the light source is a semiconductor, and controlling a semiconductor in digital means is extremely simple. It's easy. You don't need any... Dolly or DMX or anything to control a semiconductor. It's a semiconductor, like in the radio in the 60s. Yeah, It's really, really simple. We just think it's complicated. It's not. No, that's leading towards networks. And that's leading to mesh networks. And that's where the interesting bits uh, really, uh, really are. Whoops, why is that going backwards? OK, here we go. Well. That idea is hooking into this idea. Um, everybody knows the Internet of Things, LOT, IOT, whatever. That's when I say IOT, I mean Internet of Things. That means uh, items connected to Internet with their own IP addresses. This curvature is not right. Um, we're meant to be, where are we meant to be? We're meant to be around here. Uh, 23 billion devices connected to Internet. Uh, we're not quite there. The, IoT has turned out to be much more complex, uh, much more difficult to adapt. I don't think any of us live in a house at the moment that is IoT capable or some kind of a smart home that's truly IoT. But there's a certain segment of humanity who believes that this is the next big thing. My view on it is that if you think where internet was in 1985, that's where we are now. So we are now standing in a moment of 1985 looking at internet and being quite skepti uh, skeptical about it and not quite knowing what to do with it. What is it for? What is it good for? What do you need internet for? And remember, internet took, truly, um, till the early 2000s to really kick off. Um, the, the whole kind of a bubble, uh, the early uh, 2000 bubble about the internet economy was that you can't make money out of internet. There's nothing you can do with it. And then, boom, you know, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. The whole social media thing happened. Amazon happened. And now, well, we don't even think about it. Now it's just everyday life. We are in that position right now. Um, we are about 10 years away, 10 years away from the moment we don't even think about this anymore. Yeah? So it's an amazing moment. It's a good moment to be in. Um, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, IP version 4 uh, was in invented in the early 90s. It was a big thing because uh, Internet agreed, or the people providing all the um, servers and net, uh, network points and everything else, agreed to go with IP. So they agreed to a platform that had a unified language, had one language to talk about. And they had 4 billion addresses, and that was quite a lot for a planet. Yeah, That was for a planet Earth. 4 billion addresses. And that was like shitloads. Well, it ran out. It ran out in five years. And they came up with IP version 6 that had 667 sextillion addresses per square meter of this planet. OK? What that means? It means that. It means intelligent dust. It means that when we talk about mesh networks, we're not talking about connecting 
20 light fittings to a microwave and to your lock and to your uh, uh, alarm system. We're talking cellular level. And this is conceptually the heavy stuff. The, the network that I just mentioned might include your heart or maybe a red blood cell. Think about it. So it's not anymore about lighting. It's not anymore about um, internet. It's about physical beings, us, combined with our environment, being entirely connected. There's enough addresses now. And by the way, somebody can come up with the IP version 8 when they need to. So your heart will be on internet, basically. Not anytime soon. Anyway, and this is what it means. It means start us as professionals, as design professionals, and lighting is a very nice tool uh, to achieve this, is that we begin to create cyber-physical spaces where there is this a cyberspace which is then connected to some kind of UB internet. And there's a UB internet which you're not aware of, you don't need to be aware of. It's a service, it's just there, is for example IoT. So through this, you enter the physical space. So from here comes social sensing, which is super interesting. Uh, physical sensing, it goes through this layer, um, gets sent out to the cyberspace, which in practice just means you know, piles of servers. You know, there is no cloud. <laughs> this is the thing, there is no cloud. There's no cloud server. There's, it, it's just somebody else's computer. There's just computers somewhere. There's no cloud. Um, so we talk about cloud services and everything. It's just a pile of servers in, in Iceland. Um, so they go there and they get collected and they get manipulated and get shared. Now in this room right now, if we would spend some time together and drink a little bit more wine and brainstorm, we would find entire industries based on this. Entire industries based on that. That's how big this is. Physical sensing, you could build an industry around it. One of the industries that can be built around many of these things is a lighting industry. And that's why I'm very, very interested of this. Because I see lighting as the sort of a gateway, um, as a bridge to many, many, many things, because lighting can do so many things itself. And here, here we go. Um, now you have, you're, you're thinking about this great mesh network. If we then turn it into some kind of practice, but still in a quite conceptual level, if we start thinking about what is an ambient space, you know, a space that would talk to its user, um, space that extends architecture uh, into sensing and connected light, um, which then informs, decorates, entertains, creates narrative, branding, image, all these kind of things, and you can continue that list as, as uh, design professionals, um, you begin to get the idea where we're going. So the environment becomes the enabler of various kind of digital services. So right now, your phone is the augmented reality interface. And through your phone, you access uh, the cyberspace. But in the future, and this is one of the views, uh, one of the uh, research kind of directions, is that all that comes from architecture, all that comes from interior design, all that comes from light, because practically speaking, it is the light that delivers the message. Um, now, what are the real enablers? Okay, connected lighting, so that's the IoT thing. Printable electronics is one very interesting new technology um, that will allow these sort of things to become very cheap and very easy to produce. Machine vision, we kind of have that Eye tracking, we kind of have that. Context awareness, less so. So as a lighting designer, in your next project, at least start thinking in the terms of connected lighting, machine vision, possibly eye tracking, if you think it's meaningful. All this begins to make more sense later. Okay. Um, from ambient space, we're going to ambient communication. Ambient communication is, a, is essentially an older concept and uh, something that we can all start using today, um, which is essentially the idea that the, the information comes to you without user interface. So Sky is a great example. So right now, 
you don't need to really, you don't need your phone to beep and say, ah, okay, it's plus 18 and raining in Barcelona. You just know, yeah? You just know. But equally, you would know if it was sunny or if it was cloudy or partly cloudy or any, anything like this. You would also know that roughly the time for the day without any user interface. You don't need a clock, you don't need a phone, you don't need anything. It's information that flows into you without asking effort from you. And this is the key thing. Now, is, if as a designer you ever manage to create the situation where the environment is communicating to you without asking anything from you, then you've created a very relaxed, very beautiful, very human environment. If you sit by the lake, it's communicating with you all the time, of course. To create that same sensation artificially somewhere in the middle of the city is really tough because it demands from you. So light is an ambient communicator. And it can be very banal. It can be like, um, um, I can turn the lights red here right now and you think, okay, there's a fire alarm. It can be as simple as that, but it's very functional. It works. You can't really uh, say it doesn't. Now, the interesting stuff can, comes, then as us as designers, um, how do we use this? You know, it's beautiful to say that Sky communicates with us, but so what? Um, how do we, as designers, bring that in into essentially what is very artificial uh, creations, uh, human creations? So one of the questions that you can ask is how to simulate natural environments through connected lighting, thinking about this idea of um, as ambient communication, or will the simulated lighting have the same effect on people as natural light? Now, we've done a lot of work on this, this question, pretty much, and what we have found out is that if I try to mimic natural light, people do not like it. If I create a sense of it, they do. So this projection, for example, that you saw is completely digital art piece, but is actually following the Bilbao um, uh, weather patterns and is creating um, a sort of representation of the cloud form formations in Bilbao. Um, and we have got to this point by essentially uh, quite intense observation. And if you observe the nature and you begin to sort of decode the ideas there that makes us feel good, you begin to dabble into ambient communication. So, for example, if I make this light blue now, none of you will think it's a sky. That's too naive. That's childish. If I make this light ripple very gently, you know, in random patterns, after about half an hour, when you think about it tomorrow, you think, were we outside? So it's actually the movement. So it's a frequency of the movement that begins to link us back into things that we somehow consider natural, um, and we can then use as, uh, as design tools. Um, but things like, you know, mimicking a sky is a, is a, a tremendous error. sun drops down extremely early. So you go, go to school every morning, 8 o'clock, in pitch black. You leave the school 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon in pitch black. That's a dark winter. Then comes the light winter. And the light winter usually starts around February when there's a lot of snow. Um, there begins to be some kind of colors in the sky. 
and Windsor is fantastic. So this was an ambient communicator built around that, and this is a light pattern, for example, that never ever is the same. It's never the same in the in one January Tuesday and another January Tuesday. So it creates this passage of time principle. It's very natural in that sense, but it's entirely, entirely artificial. And it's meant to be so as well. But it is basically to outline the point. This is another mesh. And here the idea was that the environment changes it, so this becomes sort of reactive. Um, an auto-active piece. It's not really interactive, but interactive is something I want to talk about, but this piece has a, has a life of its own. So we gave it um, parametric behaviors, but we never programmed it. I don't know what light patterns it does. I don't know what it do, what does it do. Um, in that way, it begins to resemble much more like a surface of a river than some kind of light show. And when you are there and you spend time with this thing, you begin to sort of forget it. You don't, you don't focus on the light movements anymore. You don't focus on that effect. You just focus on the, the ambient and the ambient uh, cumulative um, aspects of it. Now, I put this thing here just to basically show that you can take this kind of approach, um, which is to think of it this mesh networks. Um, think of these sort of concepts like ambient communication. You can apply to very normal environments, like you know, a restaurant, for example. Um, this restaurant was was a, a narrative-based lighting, so it was like a storytelling lighting. But everything here was about communicating uh, the brand, communicating the story of the restaurant. So it is ambient communicator. This staircase is flowing down like that simply because the upstairs lounge, which is called the Dragon Lounge is open, so the dragon is breathing down golden lava and it's all very kind of silly and childish. But trust me, people go up. <laughs> um, so you can do these sort of lighting interventions from that sort of perspective where you're constantly communicating, um, constantly bringing in messages without user interface, without any effort asked uh, from the, from the uh, people. This, by the way, is now already, I think, seven years old, or six years old. It, it was our first project. It's like history. Um, it was fun. Um, this one is um, a mix of, if you like, explicit communication and ambient communication. So you create a reactive piece, in this case, um, using a little bit of kinetics and making it auto-active, so it has a little bit of a life of its own. Um, but when it resolves itself back into a certain kind of a pattern, that happens to be the logo of our client. So you bring, it's, it, this is branding. It's, it's direct communication. Say, hello, you know, whatever, whatever um, commercial uh, purpose might be. This is a normal uh, shopping center uh, atrium. But suddenly when digital information from the client's website um, or Twitter feeds comes in, it changes the environment. So it's a reactive environment. Um, and it begins to tell the story of the client and begins to be essentially a marketing point for them. Again, it's an ambient communicator. In this case, because nobody would understand it, we added uh, like an explicit layer. So there's literally tickets. I mean, this is very commercial work. Eh? We're not trying to be artists here. So, you know, text comes in, you know, jazz band in central walls, blah, 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 and the whole building of the environment goes nuts. What's very interesting about it is that we, again, never programmed this. There is no DMX scene setting, scene number 76. No. There is just data that's fed in and pushed through these semiconductors, the same way as you can push any data through any semi semiconductor. That's a chip change for a light designer's brain is that you don't need to anymore follow the idea of theater lighting design where the show starts and show has a middle point and show ends. There is no show. There is data that's been visualized. This is another one that's now already um, this film during the commissioning. So it's a very, very simple um, reactive, autoactive, and sometimes interactive uh, ceilings. So the idea here was that we create games, we make it fun, so the kids can sort of stand underneath the, 
ceiling, suddenly you become a light blob. Uh, that light blob starts shooting lights up towards another one, and you can move like this, and you can kill the other one, and blah, 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 blah. And then after 10 minutes, that particular game moves across the shopping center into the next bridge, and then under uh, downstairs, and so on and so forth. So it creates this kind of movement, uh, vertically speaking, inside the shopping center, which is like we call it the shop, um, washing machine effect. So there's children screaming and running in circles inside the shopping center, which is good for business. That's what it's all about. So we basically enliven the environment with a quite sort of, um, in a way, a quite a naivistic uh, a lighting in intervention. But again, it's about this uh, bigger story of communication. Now, going back here. So right now, we talked about, essentially, what you can do when you have this. You have the software, you got this network. Um, you can begin to play with it. You play, play with it either in a commercial sense or in any other sense, or in an artistic sense. But what about the hardware? So that, to us, has always been a problem, um, mainly because the architectural lighting industry does not provide very interesting endpoints, very interesting lighting hardware. If you compare architectural lighting industry to show lighting industry, in my opinion, there's like a 20-year gap or 30-year gap. In 1982, in show lighting industry, you could have a light fitting that you can dial data into and it points wherever you want it to point. It becomes, uh, it zooms in and out. It has 17 different go gobo patterns and it does any color you want. That's 1982. That was very light. We still don't have it. We still don't have anything near that. So this is our little attempt, in a most conservative architectural sense, to bring in to the world of architecture a device that does more than one thing. So this little light fitting, uh, you throw data into it, uh, very simple, either ArtNet, uh, that then converted to DMX or DALI or whatever you want. And by changing the lenses, digitally speaking, um, you change the beam of the light. So you can have a very narrow beam, a medium beam, blah, blah, blah. you can have a very wide beam. It's a very, very simple function, but done in digital means, meaning there's no moving parts, there's no lenses, nothing will break. Um, the images you see here is still a bit of a prototype, so I think you can you order it already, but there's still a bit of a product development there. As you can see, I'm not necessarily a very aesthetic person when it comes to luminaire design. Um, that's another version, and what's interesting about that is that it chucks out enormous amounts of light. So that's used as a tiny little thing. It's used 12 meters high up to light an exhibition at the moment in Milano, um, and it's pin spotting things from 12 meters away. Uh, you flick a switch, and it creates whatever 300 lux you want, uh, even light. So it's a multifunctional device. It's part of this mesh network. This is the whole idea, is that you begin to get more out of these points than just one function. Um, and then you use it very creatively, of course. Um, and this, this is where the design comes in. And now I think it'll show you the beams. It's a very slow video. But anyway, so in here, you got narrow beam, medium beam, wider beam, and very wide beam. You whack everything on, and you got an enormous amount of very white light. And so it goes, so in here you place this. Now, we never designed this fixture to be just another spotlight, however. So this whole thing is designed with a software. Now, you can use this with any lighting control system you wish, but we designed a lighting control system our own, which then allows you to really take this sort of uh, idea of ambient communication, idea of mesh networks, idea of digital content in architectural environment to the top and really do stuff with it without having to be a programmer. I got like six, seven guys who are very, you know, they're programmers, they are C++. That's a whole different world, you know. Us here, we don't need to be that. Um, so we created a software that allows you to do very creative things very quickly, instantly, without any kind of DMX programming nightmares that you're all used to. Um, and actually achieve something new. Let's see if this allows me to move forward. Okay, so this is the software. Um, 
this window explains you how to patch the lights. I don't know how technical you guys are, but if you ever try to do DMX programming, like you take like one light, two lights, seven lights, 200 lights, and then try to create something very abstract and complicated with it quite quickly, you're in trouble. Um, in architectural world, these sort of systems don't exist, so we got very frustrated about it. Um, so in here, my mom can patch this thing. You don't need to care about addressing light fittings. You don't need to care about what they are. The thing knows it uh, by itself, and you just position them. You turn a you create a patch, and then you begin to create uh, whatever lights and light movements you absolutely want. Drag and drop, very simple user interface. By the way, this is not any kind of commercial break. Uh, I'm explaining this <laughs> because it's part of the bigger story and how we're trying to essentially answer the fact that we want to do these things which are based on this uh, vision of ambient spaces, but the tools are not there. So we've ended up, uh, to some extent, uh, designing our own tools. Um, and when they're commercialized, the nice thing, of course, is that it becomes something that everybody else can do as well. So when you go into the programming, uh, you've done your patch. Um, and then let's just say, is that working? Oops, it's not working. Ah, look, it went nuts. OK, crash. We'll go to the next page. So let's just say you want to add a very complicated or complex uh, movements into these uh, groups of lights, which normally would take you two hours to program. In this case, you just uh, create generators. So the beam of light is just a parameter. The intensity is just a parameter. The color is just a parameter. So let's just say I take the, the beam and I add a graphic generator on it, and suddenly all the beams will start doing this. You will then be able to move uh, all the parameters in real time, so that it becomes faster, slower, less movement, more movement, whatever. I then add another generator onto the color um, channels, and suddenly all the colors start rippling independently on what the beam is doing. So it's incredibly complex level of programming that's achieved uh, without any knowledge of uh, programming. This is biomimicry, so like biomimicry algorithms. You drop a biomimicry algorithm over these lights right near here, and they will begin to ripple, behave like clouds, behave like birds. They'll make this space very different. You can make it so slow that you hardly notice it, but you begin to essentially create an ambient communicative space that shifts as, as the time shifts. So these are tools. Um, now, so hardware is a one big big part of the story. So we tried to answer some of it. Software is another one, and then the network. Um, and when we get to all those three things to come together, we begin to get closer to this idea of cyberspace, space, and physical space. And we begin to essentially create our services here. So lighting designer will sell services here. So we're not anymore architects who put lights into buildings. We are designers who sell services through UB Internet into the buildings. Yes? The master degree is still valid. <laughs> Don't panic. You will learn this in two months. You just need a good job. That's OK. Don't worry. OK. Well, I'll finish off with a little case study. Um, if some of this sounds a bit abstract, uh, it's because it is a bit abstract. Um, and we are in this, as I said earlier, in, in my opinion, a historical moment where now we, we need to be innovators. We need to come up with tools. We need to come up with platforms. And we also need to try out what could be done with this. So like a lot of our projects, I just see them as like prototypes. They're I'm, I'm not saying they are great or they are right. They are prototypes. They are, we try. We try out. And this is one. So we created, I, unfortunately, I can't tell you fully the concept because that would reveal you the client, and the client is, hasn't given me a permission to show these slides. 
So don't tell anyone. Switch off the camera. Uh, <coughs> so this was so roughly the client is a is a software company. So the a software company uh, that does products that nobody sees. So in other words, what they sell is not visible. Uh, nobody can appreciate it. So the simple concept was to say data is beautiful, um, and uh, through that we create lighting that, that creates a disruptive beauty. Um, and the key point is data visualization. So you all seen on YouTube or wherever various kind of data visualization uh, moving graphics, which are absolutely beautiful. So this, for example, um, shows you the the relationship between rainfall and water cons consumption in United States. States. So this is information. This is absolute information, real time data being brought to you through data visualizations. It's, it's incredible. Data can be beautiful. Um, when you then feed the data into the lighting, your environment becomes a data visualization. Your entire building is a data visualization, which is then essentially a reflection of your business in this case. So that's what they do. So in our little diagram, we identify the locations where we want to do something interesting. We said there would be uh, walls that would the data would flow through. There would be some kind of a central icon uh, in the atrium where the data would be um, uh, visible, and then it would feed into the offices. And this is where the data would come from. So our client is setting up an IoT network in their office. So this is their office. And there's all sorts of things that they measure, so temperature, humidity, CO2, whatever, indoor environmental quality index, uh, noise levels, um, indoor positioning, which is quite an interesting new thing. Uh, you know where the people are, you know there's 69 employees and seven visitors currently in the office, so this is data the lighting will use. So if in some of the projects that I showed you before, the protagonist was, for example, time. In my old school, five seasons of the year, time was the variable, and and the time was the parameter that was uh, uh, also unexpected um, to some extent. In another project, the silo for six it was the winds that created you know behavior of birds. In here is people, or a vacuum cleaning robot, um, or the electric cars that they have for the company, or company bicycles. Um, or how they use their desks, their hot desking, or how much toilet paper they have left. So all this becomes data feeds, which is completely unpredictable. I have no idea how much toilet paper these software engineers are going to use. But that is a parameter for that affects the lighting. That means we will never have the lighting the same way twice. So this is actually na nature. This is like observing nature. There's starting to be so many parametric variables, so many changes, so much unpredictable behavior that it's like watching a river flowing by. You don't know what the river is going to do. So we don't know what they're going to do in their toilets. So that's the beauty of this project. <laughs> and and here's here how, uh, how we managed to um, uh, answer to it. So we created a, a living light like a wall, an ambient light wall, and then one point where people could actually interact, like physically touch something and affect the environment. The environment. And in here you see the light moving. Uh, this is the data-driven light movement, the, in this case very subtle, very white, um, associated with the reception desk, associated with the background walls. That's the screen there. And then when you look up, you'll see this very large kind of like a three-dimensional lighting intervention where the data is streaming through um, and being visualized in real time all the time. Um, these are fabric. So everything is white fabric, uh, plasterboard, and then this uh, material here is uh, printed electronics, which is essentially like semi-transparent plastic uh, with LEDs within it. And uh, the printing process is similar. It's like printing a newspaper. Um, so you, you put sensors into it, you put LEDs onto it, you create circuits onto it, and every single pixel is individually controlled, and it's not expensive. So that goes like that. The just chimes again. Sorry, I got a new new ticket. Okay. Here we go. 
Okay. So it gives you the idea, and that, that's basically what it is. So in here is the raw material. Um, pretty interesting. And that, that's something that's going to revolutionize uh, lighting industry to some extent in the next five to ten years, is that suddenly creating very complex, very three-dimensional forms, um, using things like transparent plastics and LED combinations and sensors, will become very, very cheap, super cheap, and potentially produced in Europe. Um, and then this is the, the concept for the interface. So in this case, we're getting all this uh, data from the office, but then it needs to be visualized to somebody to understand what's going on. So these are our designs for a touch screen. It's a very unusual uh, touch screen. It's a 55-inch transparent OLED touch screen. Uh, and that's it here in our office, currently being tested. And it's not working very well yet, but it will. Um, but you see, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So you see straight through it, it's like clear, clear glass, and suddenly all the graphics appear to, within it, and then you can pick up. So you get this visualization, you'll touch it, and the whole entire environment will change uh, depending on it. So you become a protagonist as well. In, what it means in practice, then, is there's a hell of a lot of programming to do. So these are our guys in the office. Uh, running the tests. In here you see the mapping, so how all the different uh, panels are mapped, uh, where the 3D piece itself is, um, and how the data is going to be pushed through. And here's Korga doing some random C++ activity that I don't understand anything about. That's our new office, by the way. It's really nice. Um, we're, very <laughs> we're very happy. Um, and this is another part of the content design exercise. Here's Ivan doing a, it's a virtual reality model. And into the virtual, uh, virtual reality model, we push the content in real time. So we can test exactly how it is. So whilst our algorithms create the content, it's then pushed into a, a three-dimensional gaming model. Um, and you will see it in real time what's going on. So we can pretty much pre-program the whole thing before we go on site. And he's looking very concentrated. As if he didn't know that it's, he's been filmed. Um, and in this case, you see here, the piece uh, extends all the way into the office spaces as well. So it's not only in the uh, reception. So this is like a, a prototype. So in some ways, it's quite artistic. In some ways, it's um, kind of like a display. Um, but to us, it represents the first little steps towards this kind of IoT-enabled lighting, in this kind of idea of creating this mesh, creating this mesh network where everything is connected, including possibly you, um, and what can, what can happen with it. And then there's a few pictures of the reality. This project is currently on site, so this is the, oh, I don't know what that is. Um, stuff going in, and that's it. I'm going to stop now. So this is our team. I'm just going to introduce ourselves at the end. Um, it's not just me there, you know, with a lot of computers. Trust me. There are a lot of people. Um, in my opinion, this is a, a structure for a line design office that in future begins to make a lot of sense. Uh, and to us, already does. So there's a lot of software developers. There's a lot of CG going on. And then there's a lot of line designers going on. All these guys work together. Um, to create lighting uh, concepts and lighting uh, installations. And my presentation crashed again. Thank you. Ah, I just want to put my phone number up so you can call me. <laughs> call me if you have questions. You can ask now as well. Don't worry. Um, so we live in Madrid. Um, come and visit. And any questions, give us a call. If you have any questions now, you are more than welcome to ask.
there a second mic? Or? One, two. <laughs> bueno. bueno, Tapio, excelente presentación, felicidades. Gracias. Eh, <laughs> nosotros como recién egresados de Lighting Designers, como Lighting Designers del Master, ¿qué software recomiendas para empezar a involucrarnos con esta cuestión de la iluminación dinámica? Veo que que hablas mucho de la programación visual, ¿no? Entonces tenemos, no sé, Grasshopper, Py, este, Processing, Madrix, o ya tú entras en tus proyectos directo a código duro como Python o Java. We use C++. But a good, you need to think if you want to be a programmer or if you want to be a designer. So, in some ways you don't need to, like, if you want to, if you're interested, for sure, and, and start with uh, open frameworks. Open frameworks, that makes most sense. Madrix is just the lighting control software, you know, for clubs to do funny yeah. stuff. Um, it's it's one of many, it's, it's very good, but it doesn't take you anywhere. If you want to learn how to control light, you need, you need to go to C++. Um, but you don't need to. Like, as a designer, I, I'm a designer, I have no idea how to <laughs> to code anything. It, it's more that you you go and work in an environment that allows, that, that is a somehow multidisciplinary and um, has these kind of skills that allows that sort of work to happen. Um, I truly believe that uh, lighting designers and, and the lighting industry as well will have to start taking this kind of like the coding skills and, and, and those sort of teams uh, into, their, into their practices. Muchas gracias. Hello. Everybody, you got it. You're in. You believe me. No? That's what, you, that's what Tapio, usually happens. Tapio, one, one question. Um, one of one of the images that you showed, I mean, if we want it or not, did remind us of Matrix, I'm sure. Um, where do you see the lighting environment to be in 20 years from now? Super, super beautiful and positive and, and connected to us. <laughs> really? Um, like, I'm from Finland. We don't want to see any Matrix in our houses or homes or... Yeah, 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 but it's now. We are. It's now. It's it's 2016. So we're doing now what we can do now, and and it's not only because of the technology. It's also the lack of imagination. So you know, we only have so much imagination. We can only project that much. But I'm absolutely convinced that we're gonna get to collectively as a as a profession. We're gonna get to somewhere very very humanistic. So this whole digital revolution and, and, and this kind of um, embedding of technology into our lives um, has the potential of making us more human because it takes away uh, a lot of the kind of very artificial tasks and requirements from us. It gets embedded into our environments exactly the same way as, the, you know, if you'd ask uh, 50 years ago um, somebody that, you know, We'll have this thing called the dishwasher. Um, they would be, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, you're not a real person until you wash your dishes yourself. Um, but somehow, the fact that you have a dishwasher and a and a washing machine has made the families happier because the parents have time to spend more time with their kids. So, I see this kind of parallels. I see that. Um, the information being embedded into our surround surroundings and the services being embedded into our built environment will give us more time to hang out with our kids or with our friends. Maybe even a wife sometimes. But that would be in terms of services, right? In terms of lighting as such? No, li lighting is that. Look, lighting is a service. Yeah, Lighting will be nothing other than a service. So how you deliver that service is then the 
the, the work of a designer and and it's where the imagination and the creativity is required but it will be a service it will be sold as a service so in that sense then um, we look into a very manufactured driven um, future right absolutely unless you you fight the corner so the industry is always the leader it's always in, right now, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, yeah, 30 yeah. years ago, it's always the leader. Yeah. Now, industry has its own motivations and architects and design industries and, and uh, the humanistics might have others. So this is what we need to do, is we work alongside and lead the industry rather than follow them. In my opinion, lighting, design industry, lighting designers have been following the industry as long as we have existed. Now is the moment to leap on forward and get them to follow us. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Más preguntas? Um, hi. Well, first of all, I'm not a lighting designer. I'm an architect. <laughs> um, but somehow I wonder, like, well, first of all, like, a after your talk, it, it seems like it's a new horizon has been opened in front of our eyes. And, well, I guess these guys more know about it, about it but um, I don't. And I wonder, like, besides this uh, special interventions that are more like served into a certain client, uh, I'm thinking more of towards urbanism and like the way we lived in our cities, and towards psychogeography, which is like the new kind of urbanism. I would like to know, like, how, what are your dreams about it? Like, what, how do you project this f near future or far future? And just, just like out of curiosity, what do you think about it? It's a, it's a great question. There's, in my presentation, there's four slides about um, what we call cyber-physical master planning that I switched off because I figured that I don't have time to go through them. <laughs> um, we see this completely applicable to, to master planning, to urbanism. Um, because essentially, what's happening right now in all of our urban environments is a complete top-down system you do not have any ability to affect your surroundings unless you do graffiti or break a window, which is then considered somehow antisocial. So through this, you can potentially begin to affect your surroundings, but in a positive way, in a way that is actually acceptable or accepted um, by the cities and maybe they will start actually implementing it because it will make their environments more livable and more attractive. So, uh, I mean, I am very optimistic in everything in my life, but, but I do see a lot of sort of very positive opportunities there. Um, and it's very interesting to listen to the uh, industry at the moment because they're trying to tackle this very topic. Um, it's called smart city. And Currently, it's not smart at all. So, and it's fine, you know, it, it's just the first, you know. Um, and when you listen to uh, General Electronics, for example, GE from United States, their vision of a uh, smart city is absolutely totalitarian. It's, it's all about surveillance. You're only <laughs> uh, gathering information. Right exactly. So, mm -hmm. so, and you are the subjects, you know, woohoo. Fantastic. What a great future. Uh, and then there are others who who don't see it that way, and and I think that's exactly where the design industry comes in it is and and maybe the widened design industry, which also then will include more the the humanistics, you know, or any kind of behavioral science and all these kind of uh, as well as uh, community groups, um, where you actually begin to then say no 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 no, you know, in this square we like to play guitar. Uh, in the evenings, and we try to like to get drunk, and I want my facade to be like a equalizer. 
Um, so, so th these are, in my in my opinion, those sort of sort of things are the visions of the future of the of the urbanism because light is so malleable, you know, it's it's non-material. So. Time for a drink. <laughs> okay, done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.